What's up, guys, and welcome to Scourge of War Waterloo, episode 35, part 3. And uh, today we'll be continuing our less-than-epic uh, Battle of Waterloo here as the French. Uh, and I am showing you the absolute most BS easiest way to beat this scenario. Um, as I said in part 1, it's you know one of the more poorly written scenarios in the game, which is what is allowing us to... <clears throat> beat the scenario very very easily um so uh let's roll the video forward here and uh <clears throat> just keep on a going here so uh this is the last uh video where absolutely no uh combat occurs other than the artillery bombardment uh in the next video the prussians will appear this video we're taking from 1430 to 1630 uh, and the Prussians come on the map around 1700. Uh, they don't actually uh, come into in, in, engage distance of us until about 25 minutes, 30 minutes later. But uh, uh, anyway, what we've done uh, so far is redeployed the army in a totally defensive position with great interior lines uh, in terms that I have the army basically bent back on itself so that we can rapidly shift forces from one side uh, of the battlefield to the other uh, pretty quickly. Uh, we've set up an absolutely impregnable string of fortresses uh, starting from around the center of where Derlin's, Derlin's line previously was, extending all the way south to uh, the, the village of Plassenois, uh, and they're just basically sitting there waiting for the Prussians to show up. And what I'm doing here is I'm bringing some of um, uh, some of Ryle's troops in this case, in this case, uh, Jammin's brigade, uh, over to the the uh, uh, more center part of the line. There's nothing going on here on the far left. Um, the Allies are all holed up in Hugomont and behind Hugomont, and they really have no intention of coming out to fight. So I can afford to thin, really thin out parts of the. Uh, the western side of the line here and shift them over to the eastern part of the line where there's more more fighting likely to happen and uh, so that's what I'm doing here is um, uh, moving Jammin's brigade over there and it looks like I'm redeploying Soy's brigade in line and I'm just looking for a place where I can click the leader. Now, the problem with what I've done is that I already had to, I already had skirmisher units detached from both Jammin's Brigade and uh, Soy's Brigade. So my skirmisher units, because I took the entire brigade off of Take Charge to, so that I could select a formation and have them all move, my skirmisher units are now all moving to assume position within that line um, because I didn't detach them from the brigade. So uh, I may rectify that later, but it really doesn't matter uh, as far as uh, Soy's Brigade goes because this is, there's no fighting on the side of the line. There isn't going to be any fighting on the side of the line. So it really doesn't matter whether I have the skirmishers out there screening the batteries or not at this point. As you can see, the Allies have not moved from what I can see of them. They're just all sitting there. I can't see these guys, but I could previously, and that's why they're question marks. <coughs> Uh, so here we go over at Placenois. We have uh, Jacquinot's cavalry uh, set up uh, in front of the ring of fortresses. And their sole purpose, and I'm deploying them in line, uh, because while, um, while infantry melee is better in column, cavalry melee is better in line because they bring more sabers uh, uh, into contact right away. So cavalry, generally speaking, uh, is better in line. Uh, so I'm putting them in line, and the Prussians are going to come down this way, and what we're basically going to do is use our cavalry. They're going to the Prussians lead with their cavalry, so we're going to use our cavalry uh, to pretty much disrupt their approach um, and 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 force their cannon to not advance with the cavalry. They're going to have to turn around and back up because uh, when cannon is limbered and comes into uh, range of enemy units, whether skirmishers, infantry, or artillery. They won't just stop and unlimber in range. They will move out of range first and then unlimber. So by using our cavalry 
to engage the Prussians as they're coming down the road uh, and coming within engaged distance of their artillery, we're basically forcing their artillery uh, to back up and uh, and and deploy further back where they won't be as much use to the Prussians uh, as it would if they were able to bring the Prussians further forward. Um, if they were able to bring their cannon further forward. Sorry, not Prussians. Uh, <coughs> and... Um, you saw me. You saw me do this with. Uh, you saw me do that with skirmishers in uh, both the uh, Prussian core scenario, Saint Armand, as well as I did the same thing again in the the full battle of Ligny as the Prussians. And in that instance, the uh, the French led with their artillery, and so all we had to do was send skirmishers out to get near them, and uh, the batteries just turned right around. So we're kind of doing the same thing here. We're just using cavalry instead. We're going to engage the Prussian cavalry and uh, force the, uh, the the cannons to turn around because our cavalry will have come within engaged distance of them. Now you notice my units inside of uh, La High Sant here are losing men and going into negative scores. Uh, and that's purely because they're getting bombed on by the, uh, the Allied artillery and they're not engaged with anybody themselves out here because there's nobody out here. So there's no way for them to gain any points for the unit because the, the objective points go to the leader. Uh, however, they're not losing anywhere near the amount of men to be comparable to the amount of points we're actually gaining from occupying La Haie Sant. It's a hundred points a minute. None of these men are coming, none of these units are coming anywhere close to losing that many men per minute. You know, if they lose, you know, 10 or 15 men per minute, that's a lot. You know, they're not even losing anywhere near that amount. Uh, so it's worth it to have those units stay in there and occupy La Haie Sant. Uh, even though they're losing men, just because of the points we're getting from it. Um, and in, when they eventually fall below the, the amount of men needed to occupy the fort, or they break and run, I got plenty of units back there in the Orchid and, and to, to send them uh, into Lai Hassan and uh, refill the cup, so to speak. So uh, yeah, this is the, again, this is the extreme left of the line. And uh, I was just making some adjustments to uh, so that I could bring uh, um, uh, one of uh, uh, bring Jammin's brigade over to the right side of the line. So I'm readjusting these lines to kind of fill in the gap, and I'm going to have to move some of these skirmishers. Uh, I got them all mixed up because of what I did. So I'll have to reposition some of these skirmishers. Luckily, skirmishers standing there don't matter. They don't block line of sight for the guns, so it doesn't really matter that they're there. Um, and then, yeah, I'll just, okay, I'll grab these guys and clear up this mess here. We'll put them in front of the guns. This is just me shifting my lines over, trying to meet up with the uh, the other brigade over there. You guys know how ridiculously anal I am about uh, trying to keep neat lines. I'm really stupid about it, and it's just something I start to obsess over when there's really nothing else going on. Is I want to make my lines as clean and neat and straight as possible. You know, even though there's absolutely no reason for me to be to be doing this. It really doesn't matter. But uh, that's just the way I am. You know, the Emperor's watching. You gotta look gotta look good, boys. Gotta look good. So the whole reason this is able to work, as I explained in the uh, earlier videos, is that the writer of this scenario did not really do anything to compel the player to actually attack the allies because uh, we're able to get 
enough points from objectives without really actually doing that. Um, you know, taking Lai Hassan is extremely easy, as you saw at the beginning in Episode 1. It's, they don't, the units don't occupy the fort, and it's easy to just sneak in there from behind and, uh, you know, run those little KGL units off. That farmhouse, La Hai Sant, is worth just way too much. Uh, 100 points a minute uh, over the course of nine hours is, is just a crazy amount of points. Uh, and, and like I said, that's not even the end of it. Uh, at 1700, when the Prussians come on the map, the objective at Place Noir will activate uh, at, at the crossroads in rear of the church over there, and that one's worth 200 points a minute. So from 1700 to 2030, we're going to be getting like 300 points a minute. And that's not even counting all the points we're going to get from inflicting a brutal ass whooping on the Prussians. Um, so this scenario is really, really unbalanced uh, because we're able to do this. Um, uh, however, this guy I've been talking to, Hook on Steam, is actually a uh, retired computer programmer. I guess he's been a computer programmer for, for, for many, many years. I think he was actually uh, learned how to do it in the military. Um, and when I told him about this and how cheaply the scenario could be won, he was not in the least bit happy about it. Uh, so he's actually begun rewriting the scenario, uh, and it is in desperate need of a rewrite, um, where he's uh, changing the objectives around and uh, um, you know basically compelling the French player to actually uh, you know attack the Allied lines because you're not going to be able to do what I'm doing here. Uh, in, in, in his rewrite. Um, I think he changes all the forts, like Hugamont, um, La Haisant, and Papala. I think they're all going to be waypoint objectives. So they'll be worth points when you capture them, but they'll only be worth like a one-time sum, and then it's time to move on. Um, and um, he's, I think he's decreased the amount of points that the Place and Wah objective is worth, because since you know just because everybody who plays this game or plays this battle, you know, it's no surprise that the Prussians are coming and when they're coming and where they're coming from. You, you just know it from the history of the battle, you know. Napoleon at Waterloo had, you know, didn't know that the Prussians were coming, you know, until he spotted them. Um, you know, but we have that kind of, um, that, uh, you know, that uh, ability to, you know, look back and, you know, at history and, you know, we know what's going to happen. So you're always going to be able to set up more of a defense at Place Noir than historically Napoleon was able to cobble together very quickly. The only way for you to not set up a ridiculous defense at Place Noir is, you know, if you're playing dumb on purpose, you know. If you're, if you're trying to recreate it as historically as possible and say, oh, I'm only going to use the troops Napoleon actually used at Place Noir, uh, and, and, and actually, you know, knowingly play dumb uh, to get uh, more of a historical result. Um, so he's decreasing the value of the Place Noir objective, too. I think it's still a holds objective. I don't think it's a, a waypoint objective. Um... But I don't think it's worth anywhere near what it is here, which is just absurd. It's 200 points a minute, and, you know, and you have like four hours, or five hours or whatever, four and a half hours to, to milk points from it. It's just absolutely ridiculous. Um, and I think he's added some uh, waypoint objectives uh, kind of behind the Allied lines to encourage you to keep pushing forward and keep attacking and... and, and uh, you know, basically, you know, kind of compelling the French player to do what they're supposed to do in this battle, which is attack the Allied lines. Napoleon had to defeat the Allies quickly before the Prussians arrived. Um, you know, because historically speaking, you know, he he wanted to be able to do that before the the, 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 the Prussians could interfere in the battle, and he would end up having to fight two armies at once. Now, here, it's not a problem, because the Allies, even when the Prussians arrive, the Allies are just going to sit there uh, and do nothing. So we can't afford to sit there and fight the Prussians because that's all we're fighting is the Prussians. And as I mentioned before, the Prussians are no match for the Army of the North uh, 
one on one, especially in this situation where none of them, none of them have even been engaged. We're just sitting here waiting for them, so they're completely fresh. Um, so yeah, that, this is real cheap what we're doing here, but um, this is the way the scenario was originally written, and I've always tried to show you guys the absolute easiest ways to beat every scenario in the game. I realize this is ridiculous, but it is the easiest way to beat the scenario. Uh, you know, so uh, you know, on the one hand, you know, it would to, to not do it this way would be go, going against kind of my entire. Um, uh, the entire preface, or uh, the entire substance of what this this series has been about, which is about teaching you guys the absolute easiest ways. Some scenarios are easier than others, and sometimes there's no way uh, there's no way to win, but plowing straight ahead and 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 having a big fight on your hands, like in the two Lavra army scenarios that we did before this. You know, if there was another way, I'd have found it, but there isn't. Um, you know, but in terms of actually uh, showing you guys the easiest ways to beat every single scenario, I couldn't not do this because I know about it because I, I invented it. Uh, so I pretty much, you know, had to do this. Uh, and like I said, I know it's boring. I'm happy the scenario is getting a rewrite. It really does need a rewrite. And uh, to, to, to make it, you know, remotely entertaining to play. Um, you know, I hardly ever play this scenario because it's just so s poorly written, and at the same time, mentally speaking, I, c I can't play dumb. I can't force myself to do something um, less optimum than what is the true optimum, and this is the true optimum. And I, I just can't play dumb. I just don't. My brain doesn't work like that. If I if I know how to do something the most optimum way, I, I do it the most optimum way. Uh, and, and, and certainly this is the most optimum way to pre beat the scenario. At the same time, it's completely ridiculous. Uh, so it, it's in, it was in desperate need of a, of a rewrite. And um, like I said, this guy, uh, Hook, has been uh, a programmer for a very long time. He's already into the code of the game, and he's figuring it out really, really fast. Um, you know, stuff that I could never do, because um, my specialty lies in actually playing the game and how the game works in-game. So. I don't, I'm not a good computer guy at all, you know, if I can, if I can upload a, vi a video to YouTube, that's like a pretty impressive accomplishment for me. Um, so I was never able to, uh, I can't do any of the stuff that he's going to be able to do uh, in terms of actually reprogramming the scenario to make sense. Uh, I think he's in the middle of, uh, of playtesting it now, he's been reporting his, uh, uh, his kind of after action reports of his playthroughs uh, and tweaking things as he goes along, and I think he's headed in the right direction. Um, at first, I thought his point totals, or his point values for some of, the, some of the objectives were a little too low. I thought he was lowballing some of the more important objectives, but uh, uh, rather than actually increase the value of those objectives, he instead added more objectives uh, past, you know, uh, behind the Allied lines that are worth much more points to encourage the French player to keep attacking instead of stopping and holding on to objectives. Uh, so it, it will, I think it will, in the end, when he finally gets the, the, the numbers exactly the way he, he, he wants them and play tests the hell out of it, um, in the end it's going to compel the player to actually do what Napoleon had to do on this day. You had to attack the Allied lines. You had to break them. You had to, you had to come between. You had to cut him off from the Prussians and drive him west uh, or northwest. Uh, you know, back on Brussels or, or, or to the west. You really had to defeat the Allied army uh, if you were in Napoleon's position. And this scenario here doesn't actually compel you to do any of that because the points are all right there uh, in front of the Allied lines. You know, uh, so you don't actually have to engage them. Uh, and then again, you get that just ridiculous Placenois objective at, at 1700. So um, I know he's in the middle of playtesting it still. Um, uh, the one thing I would say, Hook, if you happen to see this video, the I, I think you should increase the Mont Saint Jean objective uh, to something ridiculous, to like a waypoint objective that's worth like you know, 10,000 points or something. And the only reason I say this is because. Um, 
you know, depending on it, it, depending on how long it takes the French player to actually reach Mont Saint John, or he may incur heavy casualties along the way. Uh, you know, um, I, I think it's safe to say that if a French player can actually get an, uh, 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 a substantial amount of troops, you know, to Mont Saint John and actually cut Wellington off from the Prussians, that that's pretty much the French player wins. So uh, that's the only reason I'm thinking that, you know, depending on how the, the you know, the battle may not go so well for, you know, different people playing the scenario as the French. And, uh, you know, maybe they might not get to Mont St. John with enough time to really accrue enough points from it. But I think getting to Mont St. John is more important than how long you're actually able to hold it. Um, so I think if you could actually get troops to Mont St. John, it means you win. And, you know, pu putting a, uh, a blanket waypoint objective uh, at, like, 10,000 points or something is pretty much going to guarantee that if you get Mont St. Jean, you win. Um, a very similar technique was used in the Lagarde Recule Brigade scenario, where there's no objective uh, in the scenario until the very end, and um, it's at La Belle Alliance. And if you make it out there, you get a thousand points. And all you need is a thousand points to win the scenario. So basically, you make it to La Belle Alliance, you win. And that's kind of the thought I was thinking um, uh, as far as the Mont St. John objective goes. But uh, so far, everything else uh, I'm seeing uh, from your after action reports looks pretty good to me. I definitely think it'll be an improvement over this nonsense that we're seeing here. Um, so. Uh, so yeah, so hopefully sometime soon uh, uh, there'll be a, a mod uh, of this scenario and uh, it'll be much more in line with uh, history because uh, uh, this right here is a joke. Uh, it's cool that he's taking the time to do this and, and putting in the effort because honestly, most modders in the Scourge of War community don't care at all about the stock scenarios. You know, most people that play this game um, you know, they, they play multiplayer, they play, uh, you know, in hits, in, in sandbox and user-created scenarios. Most people just aren't that interested in the stock scenarios of the game. Um, because it's all, it, it, it's all stuff you already know. There's no surprises. It's, uh, you know, you're just replaying stuff that already happened. Uh, so the fact that this guy came along and is actually interested in the stock scenarios and how unbalanced some of them are and um you know hooked is a lot more than just this scenario <laughs> that could use some balance and tweaks um you know that's that's cool that you know finally someone's come along that's actually able and interested in m making the st some of the stock scenarios you know more more balanced because obviously what i'm doing here is just such a joke and and truly deserves to be properly laughed at because it bears no resemblance at all to history uh, or or what the French player should theoretically be doing. Uh, but like I said, the scenario designer gave me no reason whatsoever to do uh, what historically I should be done or even in game what you would think the French player should do. The fact that the points are out in front of the allies is just completely nonsensical. But it is the easiest way to win this scenario, and, uh, you know, that is always what I have to show you guys. The easiest and most optimum way to win uh, any scenario in the game. Regardless of the fact it's, you know, nonsense. You know, it's stupid, but uh, that's what we're doing. You see, you can see our point total is nearly 20,000 points now. It's only... Uh, uh, it's only 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and we're only 10,000 points uh, away from a major victory. So, uh, stupid or not, cheap or not, it works. <laughs> you know, and uh, the Allies are just relaxing behind their ridge, uh, taking a siesta, drinking tea, whatever it is the Allies, you know, the British do when they're not in combat. Um, and, uh, and we're just racking up the points from... Uh, Lai Hassan. We've already gained, you know, nearly 19,000 points pretty much just from that objective.
Uh, we got two batteries here out of ammo again. Wow, are they empty? They are out of everything. How are you out of canister? You were on the grand battery. What were you, what were you doing firing canister? Ridiculous. How are they? How are they out of canister? So yeah, we're gonna have to refill those guys. Uh, this looks like a uh, either a bathroom break or a fridge break, because the cursor is no longer moving, and I brought up the mini map. But uh, you can see how this uh, this this defensive position has now taken shape. Uh, it, we're almost basically encircled, uh, and uh, or it's, you know in almost in a circle. We have very very good interior lines at this point now uh, between the, the side on Hugomont and the side at Place and while we can quickly shift troops over between different sides uh, uh, and it's you know pretty much a horseshoe shape almost defensive position so uh, we still have the uh, Lahaye Sant objective here and the reason I keep coming over and just taking a look at it is because like I said the men inside are getting bombed on from the allied artillery they're taking losses so you have to keep watching it to, to see if your men fall below the amount of men required to actually hold the objective. So that's why I keep taking a look at it. And we're just taking a little tour of the Allied lines here. What we can see of it. Obviously there's many, many more troops back here behind the ridge that we actually can't see. As well as the whole of the Allied right uh, over here behind Hugomont. Um, doesn't look like they actually have any units in Hugomont. There's two little skirmisher units. Everybody in the woods here has been slaughtered, except for Colonel McDonald, who's still, still happily standing there amongst the dead. And uh, most of these batteries have actually stopped firing because there's really nothing to shoot at anymore. They pretty much killed everybody in the woods, and uh, there's really nobody in Hugo Mont anymore. Uh, and they may, they may not be able to see those two little units on the wall. Well, here's Napoleon at La Belle Alliance, and we're closing in on 19,000 points here. <clears throat> there we go, 19,000. Uh, so in about 10 more minutes, we'll pass 20,000 points, and we'll be two-thirds of the way there. And uh, like I said, we're doing all of this with just the Lai Hassan objective, and uh, our points will actually grow, get go higher much quicker once we have the Place and Wa objective uh, as well, uh, as well as when we actually start engaging the Prussians and, and getting a lot of points from really kicking the bejesus out of them. So look at this guy. This is some setup we got over here. This is like the dream setup right here. Just look at all these guns. I mean, this is just absolutely ridiculous. And uh, once the Prussians arrive and all these guns unlimber and open up, Jesus. <laughs> you do not want to be in front of that when that happens. So here we are over by the uh, the young guard. 
which reminds me of, uh, if you guys remember in the last episode where I was talking about how I, uh, I didn't quite understand um, uh, the organization of the Imperial Guard. And um, specifically, I, I didn't know who in-game was actually the middle guard. Um, because uh, the Imperial Guard in-game are basically, in terms of the leaders that control the units, are basically divided up into the Young Guard Division, uh, the Grenadiers Division, and the Chasseurs Division. Those are all considered divisions. They all have a, uh, a division commander of their own. Um, however, as I also mentioned, I couldn't tell who was the old guard and who was the middle guard because both the Grenadiers and the Chasseurs uh, actually contain both level 8 elite troops and level 7 veteran troops. Um, so I, I didn't know necessarily who was the old guard and who was the middle guard. I had assumed the old guard were the Grenadiers because they had the majority of the level 8 units. So, um, what I actually learned from talking to Hook and Ditz on the Steam forum is that the Imperial Guard was organized basically by regiments. And uh, each one of these regiments had battalions that were Grenadiers and Chasseurs. So the way it works is that there were four regiments in the Imperial Guard, not counting, we're not counting the Young Guard here. Uh, just the, the, we're talking about the Grenadiers and the Chasseurs. And there were four regiments, the first, second, third, and fourth. The first regiment was um, the, the really elite of the Old Guard, like the troops that were with Napoleon in exile, you know, and they had served with him for, you know, 20 plus years or something. Um, you know, they were like the super old guard. Uh, and there are some battalions of that regiment that are in the Chasseurs and some battalions of uh, that regiment that are in the Grenadiers. So they're spread between both the Grenadiers and the Chasseurs. The second regiment was also called the Old Guard. And I think they, if I'm trying to remember Ditch's post, or, or um, yeah. And, uh, I think they had to serve a minimum of 12 years uh, to get into either the 1st or the 2nd Regiment. And again, they have uh, battalions of Grenadiers and they have battalions of Chasseurs. And then the 3rd and 4th Regiments were the Middle Guard. And they also have battalions of Grenadiers and Chasseurs. So the, the Old Guard was actually the first two Regiments. Uh, the first and second regiment, and there's battalions of both uh, in in both the Grenadiers and the Chasseurs, and the Middle Guard were the third and fourth regiments, um, and they had also battalions in the Grenadiers and the Chasseurs. So when I click on like the you know Freon or something or pet it and move the Grenadiers, I'm actually moving troops of both the old and the Middle Guard uh, when I move the whole. Uh, brigade, basically. It's basically, in, in this game, it's treated like a big brigade. Um, uh, so, yeah, and when I actually went and to look at the actual units in the game, all the units uh, of the 1st and 2nd Regiment, whether in Grenadiers or in the Chasseurs, were all level 8 troops. So that was definitely the Old Guard. And then all the troops I looked at of the 3rd and 4th Regiments, whether in the Grenadiers or the Chasseurs, were all level 7 uh, except for the uh, two battalions of the 4th Regiment in the Chasseurs were actually level 6. Um, so that's why I could never determine who was old and who was middle uh, guard in this game because they're, they're kind of mixed together uh, in, in, in the Grenadiers and the Chasseurs. Uh, and really no other troops in the game are handled that way, so that's why it was confusing to me. Um, but it made perfect sense the way Hook and Ditz explained it, and when I actually went and checked it in-game, uh, and went by um, the actual regiments, rather than the division between Chasseurs and Grenadiers, uh, and saw how the 1st and 2nd regiments were all level 8 and 3rd and 4th were mostly level 7s with a couple of level 6s. 
it all made sense. So, um, uh, yeah, so now I, I understand how the Imperial Guard was organized. Uh, and then the other thing I wanted to know um, that we were talking about is I didn't actually understand what the hell the difference was between a Grenadier and a Chasseur. Um, you know, the game the game doesn't really say, it just, that's what it calls them, but they, they function basically the same way uh, in-game. You know, they're just basically infantry troops. Um, uh, what I found out is that in 1815, there really wasn't that much of a difference. Uh, uh, Ditz explained to me that um, the real difference was that Grenadiers were basically considered like the heavy, heavy troops, while uh, uh, the Chasseurs were more light troops. Um, and, you know, there were certain, like, height requirements to be a Grenadier or a Chasseur and so forth. But by 1815, um, the, uh, the, the rules around being a Grenadier or a Chasseur were uh, relaxed because, the, you know, they had trouble restoring the core after, you know, Napoleon came back from exile. So it became more about troop experience and... Um, uh, uh, the, the skill that it did about whether you were a grenadier or uh, a chasseur. Uh, it became more about just, well, you've been in the army long enough to be in the old guard, so you're in. And uh, I guess whether you were a grenadier or a chasseur, uh, uh, you know, either came down to where you had previously served in the army or, um, you know, basically what they needed to fill out the, uh, to fill out the various battalions. Uh, of the Grenadiers and the Chasseurs. Um, so, uh, yeah, so basically there really wasn't any kind of difference between Grenadiers and Chasseurs as far as uh, in the game goes. Um, and uh, even in, in, in history, uh, uh, they were, it, the rules were pretty relaxed by this point as far as, you know, height requirements and whatnot. Nobody really cared. It was more about how, how long you had served in the, in the army or in the Imperial Guard. Uh, so I found all that stuff really interesting. Uh, thanks, uh, Hook and Ditz, for uh, sharing all that stuff with me. Uh, like I said before, I'm not a historian. I know the broad strokes of uh, the 100 Days campaign, but, uh, um, you know, by no means am I, like, a historian at the level that these two guys are that have been studying the battle for, you know, damn near 30 years, and, you know, and, uh, you know, what I know of it basically comes from, you know, from the game. I learned the history more from playing the game than I did, uh, uh, um, know the history before I played the game. I definitely learned way more about the 100 Days campaign, uh, from playing the game than I, you know, than I ever did, uh, before playing the game. I mean, I knew, like I said, I knew the broad strokes. I knew how it went down. Um, but, you know, I've definitely learned more details from playing this game than I ever knew before. Um, you know, so, but the game still doesn't give you the whole picture, you know, so compared to people that have been studying the, the battle and the campaign for, you know, 30 years or so, psh, I don't, I don't know anything. Uh, so, uh, you know, luckily these guys all kind of knew the answers to all my questions regarding uh, the Imperial Guard. The other thing I always was wondering is how good were the Imperial Guard? Because in-game, they're practically superhuman uh, in terms of the, especially the old guard with that level 8 troop quality. It's just absolutely devastating. You guys have seen me put that to use in, uh, in a, you know, a couple of scenarios now. Um, certainly in Napoleon's finale, we covered in episode 21, only the guard could have taken that ridge. Uh, uh, in Ligny, No Prisoners, I did a playthrough of that in episode 10, as well as uh, uh, not too bit long ago, I did a Hits playthrough. And when I did that, when I wanted to show off how Headquarters of the Saddle works, I deliberately picked that scenario because I, uh, I knew I'd be playing the Imperial Guard, which drastically increases my chances of winning uh, because of how good they are in game. Uh, so, like I said, in the game, they're like, they're like I said, they're from the planet Krypton. So I wanted to know how how accurate that was um, historically. Um, uh, you know, were the old guard really that good? And apparently, they were. <laughs> apparently, they were the greatest warriors on Earth at the time. Uh, uh, and 
you know, savage, bloodthirsty barbarians, uh, from, uh, from what Ditz tells me. Um, supremely arrogant uh, and, and, and confident that they were absolutely the best soldiers on, uh, on Earth. Uh, and uh, he related a story how at, um, uh, at Placid Wah, after the Prussians had, uh, I guess, driven the, some of the Sixth Corps back out of the village, uh, they sent in two battalions of the Old Guard, just two, and they cleared that village in 20 minutes, breaking into houses, bayoneting prisoners, smashing them over the head with their their uh, their muskets. Uh, you know, in 20 minutes they cleared out that entire village uh, of of Prussians, and were slaughtering them in the streets uh, to the point where their their commanders had to actually threaten them with the use of force uh, in order to restrain them, and then pulled them out of the town. Uh, uh, to, to, to force them to calm down because these guys were like bloodlust monsters uh, and, and replace them with units of the young guard um, so yeah apparently that level 8 troop quality is pretty re representative of how good the old guard were uh, and I was, I was surprised to hear that I never I think when uh, I think of uh, Napoleonic warfare I still kind of think of the, uh, the romantic side of warfare and, and the honor and the chivalry of you know uh, soldiers lining up to face each other, and I think uh, you got to remember that at any point in history, war is war. It's never pretty. Uh, uh, I'm now remembering that quote from the movie uh, Waterloo, where Napoleon, after defeating the Prussians at Ligny, says, "The field of battle is, or the, the field of glory, is never a pretty sight." Um, so, but I think I kind of always had that kind of romantic notion. Uh, 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 of Napoleonic warfare kind of stuck in my head uh, as being somewhat honorable and, and chivalrous, chivalrous in terms of, uh, you know, you can, rem you know, remember uh, when the, uh, in the movie where the officer wants to take a shot at Napoleon as he's uh, riding by and uh, asks Wellington for permission to fire and uh, Wellington says, certainly not in his most gentlemanly way. So that's kind of how I've always pictured it. So to think of uh, the most elite troops of Napoleon's army as being, for lack of a web better word, bloodthirsty thugs, uh, I guess didn't fit my perception of, of what the Imperial Guard really was. Um, but, you know, if you really, if you think logically about it, if you're the best troops in an army, that's exactly what you would have to be. You would have to be recklessly brave and, 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 and bloodthirsty and, uh, uh, you know, savage animals in battle uh, in order to actually, uh, you know, be the best troops in an army. Um, so, yeah, it was pretty eye-opening, uh, this, this discussion I've been having with these guys. Um, and I especially found that really interesting that, uh, you know, the Imperial Guard was that damn good. <laughs> So anyway, we are at about uh, 10 after 3 here in the afternoon, and uh, there's actually not too much I'm doing at this point. Everything is at this point pretty much set up the way I want it to be. We can see we have routed another allied gun here, and uh, they're heading for our lines, which I don't think is the right way to go, fellas. Brussels is the other way. But uh, nevertheless, that's where they're going. And... Uh, We'll just follow them on their little trail here, and, uh... They actually just roll right by my artillery, and I don't think they actually surrender until they come in contact with infantry. So, I, I don't think you can surrender to the guns. I think you have to surrender to infantry. <laughs> so I think these guns, this gun here, is just gonna roll right on through our battery here. And there they go, just uh, passing our guns like they're not even there. However, if they keep going the direction they're going, they're pretty much going to run into an infantry square at some point, and uh, I think then they'll surrender. Haul up the white flag, boys. 
And shouldn't the horse be in front of the wagon? Like, shouldn't the horse shouldn't the horse be pulling the the? Right now, the wagon is moving on. The cannon and the caisson are moving on their own, and the and and the horse is back here. <laughs> but I don't think that's quite right. So there they go. They surrender. And then they disappear from play. So at this point, we're just pretty much doing supply wagon runs, just keeping the grand battery firing. You can see at this point we've now driven off this uh, Dutch-Belgian forward unit that was on the forward part of the ridge. They've decided that they don't want to stand here and get bombarded on any longer than they've already been, so they have uh, they have off and run. As you can see, they have lost a lot of men. So, like I said, artillery isn't that effective in Scourge of War, but over a period of hours, that's when artillery can really rack up the hits. That's why it's important to do these supply wagon runs and actually keep all the guns firing. Um, because over time, they will rack up points. Except for these bozos here, these horse battery, that I, I refuse to move because I'm being stubborn for some reason. They just keep losing men. So we've actually lost a gun. They're down to five, they're down to five guns now. But if we can route one of the, if this battery can route one of the allied guns, then we'd get a lot of points back. So it's like I'm trying to like recover points by leaving them here, which is really dumb. I should just cut my losses and move them back. They're, they're not a, they're a horse battery. They have smaller guns. I'd be better off bringing an eight gun, you know, heavy battery up there. Uh, so once again, we have a battery withdrawing because they're out of ammo. Let's see what they're out of. Wait a minute, they're not out of ammo. They're out of canister, but they're not out of shell. Why are you guys withdrawing? See, I can't see any logical reason why this battery, why this gun is withdrawing. Their fatigue is okay, their morale is high. They're not out of shell, which is what they should be firing. But they're selected on canister. That's stupid. Why are they selected on canister? I may have to bring them back up and actually select the right... It's actually two guns that have fallen off the line here. And actually select uh, shell. Because uh, this shouldn't be happening. The game is always supposed to know what, what munitions it should be using. You wouldn't be firing canister at, uh, at at units that are more than 200 yards away. The guns won't even fire canister at units that are 200 yards away. So I don't know how the hell they ran out of canister. At no point has this battery been anywhere near within 200 yards of any enemy units. So really this shouldn't be happening. I may find a use for uh, McCary F's artillery mod uh, that lets uh, the battery commander select the munitions after all, if this doesn't fix, fix itself. So I've got the supply wagon in position and these guns should re-ammo themselves uh, once they get into position. I don't think the guns just walking by will do it. I think they actually have to stop and come to a halt for the battery, for the battery, the gun to resupply. And I'm just pain in the butt with the supply wagon and waypoints now. Come on, move. All right, so now they've got seven rounds of canister, but they're selected on the right thing, which is 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 uh, shell and they're unlimbering. So that just made no sense whatsoever. They were they had a full supply of shell to be 
begin with when they retreated. All I did was fill up their canister, and this battery, the same thing. But they're now selected on shell. So who knows, it might have just been a, a bug. This game is notorious for some glitchy behavior sometimes. But I'm going to try and fill them up with canister anyway, because that seemed to have gotten them to unlimber. You know, they're selected on shell now. All right, so now they've got their seven rounds of canister back, but they're uh, they're gonna unlimber and, and use shell, which is what they should be using. Nobody's within 200 yards. There's no reason to be on canister. And now we'll just do a general supply wagon run of the entire battery and make sure everybody's upped on their ammo. And uh, here we got another battery that's selected on solid shot, full of ammo, uh, yet they've pulled back from the line and their morale and their fatigue are fine. Doesn't make any sense. So what I'm doing, I'm just going to move the supply wagon into range of where that battery, that gun goes, and uh, just use the battery commander to reselect the formation so these guns come back up and resupply. I have no idea why them being out of canister uh, or even how they got out of canister to begin with, um, would, um, and I'm actually using the, uh, the, here I'm using it, the, I'm making them use shell, because I, I just don't understand why this shouldn't be happening. What does being out of canister ammunition mean when you're, when you're firing shell? It, it shouldn't make one bit of difference. I can't even figure out how these guns ended up firing all their canister when nothing has come within 200 yards of them. Doesn't make any sense. So, but nevertheless, here we go. We're, uh, they've got their seven rounds of canister now. It's really peculiar behavior. Uh, from the game. It, it, it's not supposed to do this. It's like they were selected to fire the wrong munitions and and then did so and then retreated from the line when they should never have been firing canister to begin with. Now, I'm not even sure that happens, like how that happened because the game is not even supposed to let artillery fire canister unless a target is within 200 yards. It's, you know, so yeah, like I said, very peculiar behavior. Uh, from the game right there. Just admiring my handiwork here. They're just sitting pretty over there, waiting for the Prussians to show up and throw them the beating of their lives. Uh, and I'm just shifting this cavalry division over a little, a little bit to the north, just to be uh, more behind the center of the line here. Because I said the Prussians come down this way, so this part of the line will be more threatened by than this part of the line will, because they kind of come down along the road right into this whole setup we got here.
And again, I'm just always taking a look at Lahai Sant, make sure we're still got enough men in there, still getting enough points. Um, taking 300 losses in there so far, so uh, we're 21,000 points now. 9,000, almost 22,000, so about 8,000 points away from having enough for a major victory. Like I said, silly, I know, but... Certainly the easiest and most efficient way to beat this uh, scenario. If not the most exciting. And you can tell that the fort now has taken a lot of damage uh, in terms of, you can see that it's been set on fire and there's a lot of smoke coming to um, coming towards it. And I believe that as forts take, um, as forts take damage, their, uh, sort of their defensive value uh, lessens and you get less protection from it um, uh, as they take damage. Uh, given the fact that we, you know, as I mentioned in the grog the newest Grog Toolbar video that we just discovered that um, uh, defensive positions do indeed have different values. Uh, I'm not actually sure about that. Uh, that the forts actually, whether their defensive value stays the same no matter um, how much damage the forts take, or if as the fort takes damage, uh, its defensive value becomes less and less and less, and it offers less protection. Um, Again, we only just gained access to that information not too long ago, so that will definitely require further testing. Although I'm not quite sure how we would test that. Um, because obviously while, uh, while the fort is taking damage, I've also routed one of the guns uh, one of the guns behind, uh, one of the Allied guns behind Lai Hassan. So that battery is no longer putting out the same volume of fire. So the conditions are different. And being that forts take damage usually over a long period of time, I don't know how you could test that and remain consistent all across the board. Because obviously as the battle goes on, you know, the fort takes damage, that's one thing that changes, but, you know, a whole host of other things change around it, too. So we're all ready to go here. We're just waiting on the Prussians to show up. We've got our batteries behind our squares. Skirmisher screening everything because it's going to reduce the amount of damage everything takes, as well as acting as baits for ca enemy cavalry charges. Uh, we have our supply e a supply wagon for each battery here, or uh, some of these ba some of these supply wagons have to cover two batteries. But uh, if I can find more, uh, I'll bring try and get one for each battery if I can find more supply wagons. There are more guns than there are supply wagons, so... It can get tough after a while. Especially when you have as many guns deployed at this point as I do. Uh, we have all of the six core guns over here. We have uh, all of the uh, reserve artillery from the Imperial Guard. Um, as well as some of the batteries uh, from the Grand Battery. So we've siphoned off a lot of guns to, to make this position as impregnable as possible. And I'm, I think this is Lobau over here, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm moving him off just uh, behind the lines, just so I can find them easier. Because when officers are up in the line, sometimes it's kind of hard to find them. So like higher command officers, where I can see point totals and so forth, I will try to move them back behind the lines where there's some place where I can more easily see them and just click on them and see how they're doing. <laughs> Whereas um, 
uh, brigade commanders I'll try and keep kind of close to the line so uh, they can they can give their troops the commander bonus. Which, when I click on a, a leader, you can see that the stars appear above uh, their units, and those stars symbolize that those units are receiving the commander bonus. So when I click, if I click on this battery commander, uh, well, I'm just sending the supply wagon over here, but uh, when, when I click on a leader that's near his troops, you'll see that, uh, and I, I think I covered this in the, the Rod Toolbar Demystified series at some point. Um, when you click on a leader, and you'll see stars appear above the units that they are giving the commander bonus to. Um, and units just have to be in range of a leader to get that bonus. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be um, units that are under that leader's command. There's a separate marker that denotes, and that's these green dots right here. These green dots denote what um, what units are actually under this leader's command. So this this leader commands this battery, but he was only in range to give a couple of those units the, the, the commander bonus, which I said is the star. So you can see all these units here, but only these few units on the left were actually getting the, uh, the, the commander bonus. However, this commander is actually giving them to all of his batteries, or all of his guns. So we are at uh, 22,600 points here. So uh, creeping along, creeping along, and I think by uh, by the end of this uh, video, at around 16:30 or so, we should be we should be damn close to 30,000 points. And uh, we've inflicted 2,700 casualties and only taken a little under 400 casualties. Uh, most of that probably being artillery, because most of our infantry is pretty well hidden. So, uh, 15.30, alright, so we are an hour in to this video, and uh, we're at 22,700 points, and uh, we're just kicking back and uh, racking them up. Now it looks like we routed another gun up here, because I only see four. This was originally a six-gun battery, uh, so it looks like the uh, the artillery down here by La High Sant that's firing counter-battery fire here, because it's the only units they can really see. Uh, is having an effect because at this point now we looks like we're down to I think it's four guns over there out of six so we've we've routed at least two battery two guns over there out of that battery and we've driven off this uh, Dutch Belgian forward line uh, there's another one out here I'm not sure if we've run them off I'm more interested in doing supply wagon runs uh, at the moment than I am seeing how many enemy units we've run off. And I'm trying to keep up on the supply wagon runs because of what happened before with, you know, guns seemingly falling off the line uh, for what appeared to be no reason, you know. I don't know how they even used their canister, but... Uh, Needless to say, I'm just doing supply wagon runs to see if I can keep that from happening again. So look at this de defense in depth we have here, guys. So we have our main line of the fortress right here. We have our cavalry out in front here to attack the Prussian cavalry when they appear. And then we have all these reserves back here. We have cavalry, we have more cavalry here, more cavalry here. Uh, the Imperial Guard here, the Imperial Guard here, uh, so there's just depths uh, and layers and layers of defense here. If by some miracle the Prussians were actually able to crack some of these fortresses open, which would really, really be a miracle. And I've obviously thinned out this side of the line quite a bit, but like I said, nothing really is happening over here. These, unit, these troops all in here will not do anything unless you approach them.
And the only reason I even have part of the line still sitting over here is just I don't need I don't need that many troops over here. This is this is ridiculous over here, right here. What we got right here. It's just nuts. So this was clearly a a fridge break or a bathroom break or something. Uh, because I just I when I go on break I tend to always leave the mini map open. <laughs> So you can see the cursor is not moving, so I'm obviously not here at the moment. So as long as the... Uh, I'm back. So as long as the other me is back, uh, the current me is also going to make a fridge run. I'll be right back, fellas. Alright, and I am back, fellas, and holy crap, is it snowing outside. I just looked out my window, and it is a freaking whiteout blizzard going on outside. That's gonna suck in the morning. I mean, it is just crazy how much snow is falling right now. Alright, Napoleon, how you doing? 23,000 points. Just keep racking them up. And uh, out of the entire 77,000 something men, we've only lost about 400. So, just a flesh wound. Tis but a scratch. As I said, this is kind of a slope here. Uh, so. A lot of our troops here are down behind it, so they can't really be seen by the, uh, the Allies, so they can't be targeted. Really, the only thing the Allies can see is the gun line. Uh, and you can see we have driven off that other Dutch-Belgian unit. So uh, all the forward lines uh, of the Allies have been run off at this point. They still hold uh, Papalot, which we don't even care about. It actually might have been cool if I had taken Papalot. I don't think that would have activated too many other allied troops if I just took Papalot. But if I had taken Papalot, it would have prevented presented some interesting situations later on as uh, some other Prussian units begin to try to arrive uh, via that road in front of Papalot. And had I been able to take Papalot and actually set up some units uh, with artillery and stuff, that might have made for some interesting crossfire situations. But I, and I wanted to make the fortress as strong as possible. I didn't really want to detail troops to go and actually take this area. And, you know, if I controlled that area, I would have had to control kind of all of this, too. And it just seemed like more, more effort than it was worth. So, yeah, as you can see, this line has also taken heavy casualties and run off. Um, this unit also took heavy casualties. It looks like most of Bylands Brigade on top of the ridge is still intact.
And uh, this is the uh, Bois de Paris over here, Bois de Paris. Uh, I think that means Woods of Paris. Um, and kind of this is the area that the Prussians kind of come down from. You know, they kind of headed from Wavre to kind of Ohain, and then they kind of came down from there. This battery's doing good. They've got uh, 368 points. Send the supply wagon uh, through the orchid to the other battery again. And this battery's got 157 points. I would think they'd have more given the fact that they've run off these two guns, but maybe it was the battery on the other side that actually did it. Twenty three thousand five hundred fifty points. And slowly but surely we're just every minute we're accruing another hundred points. Twenty three thousand six hundred and fifty five points. So uh this is definitely a case of uh slow and steady wins the race here. it up on the supply wagon runs. Keep those keep those gun case on full. Because it's really the only arm I have doing anything at this point in time is, is artillery. That's basically all we're doing is just trying to keep a constant bombardment up. And uh, all I'm doing is checking these units uh, for casualties. I'm basically making sure they're in spots that they can't really be hit. So this battery has taken three casualties, but that's nothing. That's that's not even a gun. That's just a couple of artillerymen, so they're doing fine. They've inflicted almost 300 casualties, so... They've run off... They've definitely either bombed away on some infantry or run off a few guns for sure. All's well with the young guard over here. <clears throat> now, yeah, this isn't a heavily defended position, but again, this is on ex the extreme, extreme right of the, the the French here. So I'm not expecting that that area is really going to get too heavily hit. So um, that's why all I really have is the young guard over there. But behind them, I have a whole bunch of cavalry. So you know, if anything were to break through, uh, you know, I have a whole bunch of cavalry to move forward, put them into square, and then I could send the Imperial Guard forward to smash them. Which is the same idea I have going on over here. If anybody breaks through, the cavalry will force them into square, and then I could send the, uh, the grenadiers uh, forward to smash them. So yeah, not, not really too much going on at all at this point. The, I'm pretty much at this point finished with my deployment uh, of the army. I'm pretty much happy with the, the way it is currently. Uh, so I'm just uh, doing supply wagon runs, keeping the guns firing, and uh, basically counting the points and waiting for the Prussians to arrive. 
Now, when playing the scenario, I didn't, I, I, I didn't actually know when the Prussians are uh, arrived. It's, I think there's some, some uh, uh, variability as far as when the Prussians actually arrive. They can arrive a little earlier, a little later. Um, so, you know, uh, later on, uh, you'll start seeing me like opening the command map, the mini map, more and more, just looking for them because I, I you know, I'm never sure exactly when they're going to arrive, so I'm just keeping my eye out. They, they arrive around 1700. I know that now because, you know, I finished the scenario. Um, but at the time I was playing it, of course, I didn't really know, so I just kind of kept look, kept a lookout for them to see when they would actually arrive. So at this point, I've got two supply wagons on the Grand Battery, and I've got this one pretty much dedicated to the left side of the Grand Battery, while this one is pretty much dedicated to the right side of the Grand Battery. So I move them forward, they meet in the middle, and then they go back. And we just keep uh, keep doing the supply wagon runs and keeping all the guns filled. While these two batteries have this supply wagon, and I kind of move to one battery, resupply them, and then run them back across the orchard to the other battery. So yeah, we are definitely down to four guns on this battery here. Definitely taking out two guns. So this battery is only at about 60% of its previous effectiveness. However, you can see Lahai San has taken a substantial amount of damage at this point. But we're still getting points from it, and that's worth way more than any casualties our men inside might be accruing. My supply wagon is taking a rather roundabout route here. We kind of want to get them back by the caissons. Uh, the supply wagons actually refill the caissons, not the guns themselves. So you kind of want to keep them back behind the caissons when you do these uh, supply wagon runs. So, uh, yeah, I'm popping open the mini-map, and all I'm doing is looking for Prussians at this point. It's almost 4 o'clock, so, uh, you know, I'm just keeping an eye out for them. I know they're on the way at this point. They're definitely on the way. So, you know, it's curious that the guns that fire solid shot actually carry a lot more canister fire. They got 34 rounds on that gun. So the uh, the way the the ammo works in this game um, isn't isn't quite clear. The only thing I can see is that the uh, some of the guns are like uh, six pounders, uh, and and some of them are five and a half inch howitzers. So maybe they're the amount of ammo each different type of gun carries is is different because some of them some of them fire solid shot, but some of them fire shell. And I, I think it's the howitzers that fire shell and the six-pounders that fire solid shot, uh, while they all seem to fire canister. I don't know that I've really ever seen French guns with shrapnel. That might be more of an allied thing, as far as shrapnel goes. But I think the, the all the French guns have canister, whether they're howitzers or, or regular guns. But I think shrapnel is more of a, 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 an allied thing. So uh, here we have Jack and O's division. They are all under AI control. As I said, uh, when the Prussians come forward, I'm not really looking to defeat them, just disrupt them. So it doesn't need to be a pre precision rob attack. I'm kind of happy to let the AI take care of it and just, you know, basically tangle the Prussians, get the Prussians all tangled up. That's kind of what I'm looking to do. So I've got them set on hold. When Prussian units move within their engaged distance, uh, they will move out to engage them. Yeah, 
Just throw another skirmisher unit out, out here to complete the skirmisher screen here. I should have moved them a little further forward and, and put them in the hedgerows so they at least got that benefit, but uh, I think I was more concerned with keeping their lines nice and neat. <laughs> So, yep, looking for them Prussians. So, 24,700 points. Closing in, closing in. A little over, a little over 3,000 points and we'll have a major victory. So that's about you know, a little over 30 minutes, half hour or so. 3,000 points, yeah. Yeah, I realize this is uh, this is pretty boring to watch, guys. But this is this is the last video that's truly boring all the way through. Uh, in uh, in the next video, the Prussians will arrive, and uh, then for at least an hour, hour and a half or so, you're gonna get something worth watching. Hmm, 289 points for that battery. They're doing good. 225 for that battery. They're doing good. Who's the big killer out of these guns? Oh, there's one. 50 points for that gun. And almost 400 points for this battery. These, these guys are the award winners right here. So yeah, we've totally driven off uh, this Dutch-Belgian unit here. One, two, three, four, five. Looks like we've driven off a gun here because most of these guns are six-gun batteries. Violent looks like he's hanging in there. All his units are still uh, still napping in the sunken road up here. 95th rifles are gone. They've taken a hike. Oh, these guys look, these guys that were down minus 72 are only down minus 16 now. That can only mean they've, they, they routed a couple of guns. At least two guns they've routed. Uh, if, they're, if they're back to minus 16 from minus 72, you can only gain points like that from routing guns. Because it's like, it's like 30 points for a routed gun. So if they routed two, that would be like 60 points, which would kind of bring them back to kind of right where they are now. So they routed, that, it was worth it for me to leave them there. They routed two guns. My stubbornness paid off. So I'm just itching to unleash this, unleash this fortress on the Prussians. 25,000 points. So... I'm sorry, we have 5,000 points for a major victory, so, uh, yeah, no, that would be about almost an hour, so we still, we still have a little ways to go. I thought we were like 27,000 for some reason. So, yeah, uh, let's see, it's 1550, I'm stopping at 1630, so... We'll probably be just under it when this when this uh, when we hit uh, sixteen thirty. We'll probably be at like twenty nine thousand points or something like right there.
And clearly this was another break. So really not too much to talk about at this point. I don't know how many times I can keep saying supply wagon run. Because that's really all I'm doing at this point. There's really nothing else going on uh, of any kind of significance. We're really, we're, we're deployed, we're, we're, just, we're just waiting on the Prussians at this point. And like you said, literally, that's all I'm doing now is just just supply wagon runs to keep the uh, to keep the grand battery firing. I'm really not sure why uh, why they chose to make La Haistan worth so many points. That's an, it was an odd choice to do that, especially given how isolated um, how isolated it is from the rest of the Allied lines. Meaning you can capture it without really uh, without really engaging the Allied forces, other than those three little units that start out in the orchid in front of Lyasan. Um, you know, it was, it was, in, it was important only in so far as it was an obstacle, uh, for the French, uh, to get, to get by it in terms of, uh, getting at the Allied center. It was an obstacle in that regard. It, uh, it certainly acted as a breakwater in terms of, uh, making it hard for the French to just move by it, but it wasn't—it wasn't an objective in and of itself. I don't think in the battle, the only objective was to capture it so that it would stop being such a pain in the butt uh, for the French trying to get by it. Uh, so in that regard, I—I I, I agree with. Uh, with Hook's idea of rewriting it so that it's a waypoint objective, I agree you should get some points for capturing it, but making it an objective like this in and of itself that lasts the entire game, um, I just think it ends up being it, it ends up being worth too many points and it's too easy to get and too easy to hold on to because as long as you don't move past it, the Allies won't ever go and try and recapture it. So making it a waypoint objective where you'll get some points for capturing it, but after that it's really not worth anything, that makes more sense because that, to me, coincides with the role that that farmhouse played in the battle in terms of um, being a, an objective only in so much as it was obstructing the French's ability to make a really coordinated attack on the Allied center because you know, that fort was in the way, and it was, you know, armed with, uh, you know, it was garrisoned with by, uh, you know, riflemen. I think they were armed with, like, um, uh, Baker rifles and so forth, I think the KJL were armed with, which were, um, 
um, flintlock rifles, but, um, you know, I think, you know, they took a long time to load and so forth, uh, but, you know, they were, they had better accuracy than, than the, uh, the smoothbore muskets that the regular line infantry used. Of course, the smoothbore muskets were much, much quicker to load and fire because of the, the way the cartridges were rolled. It was an undersized ball, so, uh, all they really had to do was, uh, bite off the tail, prime the pan, and then throw, you know, empty the powder down the barrel, and then throw the whole cartridge down the barrel, paper and all. And, uh, you know, so it was, you know, it was much easier to, to load the, uh, the smoothbore musket. <coughs> it didn't, the ball didn't, could be undersized because there was no rifling anyway. But for something like a rifle where the, the, um, the barrel actually has, um, grooves, spiral, spiral grooves cut into the barrel, in order for that to be effective, the projectile actually had to grip them so that the projectile would leave the barrel with a spin. And obviously when you spin a projectile, it stabilizes it. It, it stabilizes it. It gives it better velocity, and it stabilizes its trajectory for a longer distance. So after a couple of shots, a rifled barrel would, be, would become fouled because black powder did not burn very cleanly. Uh, and it would become much, much harder to load, but you still had to load that, that tight-fitting ball in order to get the, the, any kind of accuracy out of it. Whereas with smoothbore muskets, they didn't, they were less concerned with accuracy because um, they were more concerned with actually putting as much lead downrange as, as quickly and uh, as possible and keeping up a steady rate of fire, much more so than they were concerned with individual marksmanship. So the idea behind the rifle and the, the smoothbore musket were, were different in that regard. No Prussians yet. See, we got something routed over here. What do we got over here? This is probably an artillery battery. Looks like we routed another Allied gun. It would be great if it was my little horse battery over here that actually did that. I would like to see, but it looks like at this particular moment I decided to take another fridge break or bathroom break or something. I'm definitely thinking that's a routed Allied gun, though. I don't know if I saw that routed allied gun on the map before I closed it, and maybe we go over and see who it is. I don't remember. But it looks like I am more concerned with doing supply wagon runs. Uh, so there it is. Who is this? Can I see who this is? All right, that's definitely a gun. Uh, that definitely is a gun. Doesn't look like I spotted it when I was actually playing, but I do see it now. So, uh, okay, one more Allied gun out of commission. 
And they're entering the uh, our lines here, where they will no doubt surrender and disappear. So yeah, looks like I missed that one when when I was uh, when I was playing. But you know, when I'm playing, I'm uh, I'm more concerned with what I'm doing than. Uh, uh, actually uh, observing as much, whereas now sitting here watching it after the fact, I'm, you know, just watching it and probably able to see more than I was actually looking at, in, you know, when I was actually playing it. So we're at 26,300 points, just past 4 o'clock here. So, uh, yeah, and I think at the end of the scenario, we're probably going to be close to 29,000 points. So, uh, will be just right under what we need for a major victory. So this battery here has taken a pounding. Look at this, they're down to two guns. Looks like we got two batteries over here. Down to four guns over here. So these guys score is still the same. amazing the amount of ammo these supply wagons can carry. I mean, literally, you are never, ever going to run out of ammo. These supply wagons just have, like, ridiculous 490,000 rounds. Really? Like, it would never, ever, ever, ever run out of ammo. That's not a supply wagon. That's a supply train. And every one of them have stupid numbers like that, too. They all are carrying just an immense amount of ammunition. I feel like I've definitely seen supply wagons that have over a million rounds. See, these guys definitely gained a lot of points back by routing a couple of batteries. Because they were real negative before. They were like negative 70 or something. Still no Prussians. Like I said, they don't show up for another hour and a half or so. But we are ready to meet them. And uh, this is uh, Daman's Cavalry Division. And uh, I think behind, we have, uh, on the other side of the town, I think we have Subbury's Division. And there, of course, is the Imperial Guard. With their furry uh, Imperial Guard hats. And the Chasseurs of the Guard. And like I said earlier, I finally had my uh, Imperial Guard mystery solved. Uh, both the Grenadiers and the Chasseurs both contain members of the Old Guard and the Middle Guard because uh, it was grouped by regiment, not by whether you were a grenadier or a chasseur. So these regiments have both grenadiers and chasseurs. So um, if you're ever looking for which units are the old guard and which units are the middle guard, one way to tell is but that only the uh, old guard units have uh, level 8 troop quality. Uh, and the other way is by regiment. 
the old guard is made up of the first and second regiment, the middle guard is made up of the third and fourth regiments, and then the young guard is the old, their own thing. They're actually uh, delineated as young guard in the game. <clears throat> another score check here. So these guys have gone up to 316. These guys are now up over 400. Way to go, fellas. So they're still inflicting good casualties. And uh, Jammin's brigade from, uh, from uh, Ryle's Corps I had brought over uh, just so I had more troops in that area where the uh, the line starts to kind of bend. So we have gotten 23,000 points from La Sant alone. So most of our score, basically. I think our total score is like 26,000. So uh, the vast majority of our score has purely come from La Sant. It's just crazy how many points it's worth over time. happy with uh, the crookedness of Soy's line here. I tend to always put the artillery in front of a formation. A lot of the, forma the stock formations put the artillery in the back, but I always like to put them in the front. And in this instance, I'm putting them in the front because I have absolutely nothing better to do at this point than move units for no reason. <laughs> That's the truth of it. <laughs> I really am just kicking around, earning points from La Sant, doing supply wagon runs, and just waiting for the Prussians to get here. That's all I care about at this moment. Like, oh my god, Prussians, get here already. Because this, this is starting to uh, even test my patience, and I am a lame player. You know, I'll play as cheap as can possibly be, but you have to be, you have to be a real cold-blooded son of a bitch to play this cheap. Like, your normal average person right now would be like, I've had enough of this. I'm going to go attack the Allies just because I'm bored and there's nothing else to do. So, yeah, you have to be really, really, really lame to play this cheap. It looks like some of these guns have actually pulled back from the front line. Not routed, but they've pulled back from the front line. Uh, maybe because they're out of ammunition, and um, as I said, the AI is not always uh, as diligent as I am when it comes to supply wagon runs. I'm always kind of right on top of it. As you can see, I've already got my supply wagons laid out throughout the fortress here uh, so that they're ready to keep these guns uh, in supply because... As you've already seen, a lot of these French guns do not carry a lot of canister fire. Some of them only carry seven rounds. So they'll burn through that when the Prussians 
you know, advanced to within 200 yards, they'll blow through seven rounds of canister lickety split. Uh, so you really have to uh, keep the supply the supply wagon runs going. Uh, and as I said, the AI is not always quite as diligent about it as I would like them to be. Uh, so I tend to I tend to micromanage even supply wagon runs, you know, because uh, I'm more diligent about it than the AI is. Because a lot of times when guns run out of the ammo that they're supposed to use, like if units are within 200 yards and they've run out of their canister, they'll 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 fall back. They'll come off the gun line, and it's more of a pain in the ass to reform the gun line. Uh, than it is to just for me to just keep on top of the supply wagon runs myself. Because when you reform the gun line, you still got to find the supply wagon and resupply the guns anyway. Otherwise, they'll just fall back again. Oh, look at this. One of my guns has routed. Oh, boy. So, yeah, one of... Uh, Antoine Coutin's, Coutin's guns have routed. I'm very unhappy about that. I don't like even lo I don't like even losing a single gun. So twenty-seven thousand four hundred points. So now I'm doubling down on these supply wagon runs because now I'm pissed that I lost the gun. So I want my grand battery here to really make the allies pay for it. Because, yeah, I just lost the gun. However, haha, they're down to three guns over here now. So I may have lost a gun, but so did you guys. And we really kicked the crap out of this battery. They got two guns left out of six. These guys got are down to half strength now. They're at three guns out of six. And, uh... This looks like a mixture of two different batteries. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this is either an eight-gun battery, which I think it might be because I only see one battery commander. So maybe this is an eight-gun battery. So 27,500 points. Although I thought the Allies generally organized their batteries in six-gun batteries. But I don't know, maybe they had one eight-gun battery over there. These boys have gotten 427 points, or 431 points. They just got another hit. here. I'm taking a lot of breaks. You can tell at this point I'm just like, oh, just get here already, Prussians. For all I know, I'm out in the living room checking my email right now. You know, at this point in the battle, at after 4 o'clock, there's just really not much more for me to do, other than just keep the guns firing. There's really no more troop movement that needs to happen. I'm pretty much set up the way I want to be set up. Especially over at Placid Wah, where it's just, you know, an insane link linkage of fortresses all linked together like that. Oh, am I bummed about this? That, that I am still... 
I am still bummed that I lost the gun. They dropped all the way down to 13 points because they lost 30 points from uh, having a gun wrap. And then another 30 points when the gun surrendered, so they actually lost 60 points. The gun should have routed back towards France, not towards Brussels. So almost 28,000 points here. Like I said, by 1630, we'll probably be just under 30,000 points. <coughs> and uh, we've still taken just very few casualties, only about 500 casualties. And we've inflicted just over 3,000 casualties on the Allies, purely from artillery. So, uh, like I said, the, uh, the French artillery uh, is just great. And it's just amazing how much of it they have. Uh, compared with the uh, Allies, who don't have anywhere near as much artillery. <coughs> These gunners are tough, man. They've been firing their guns for hours now, and they're still keeping up a really good rate of fire. And uh, I think most of the guns still have pretty good fatigue. They're they're real troopers, these guys. Three hundred fifty-five points for them. And that battery, well, they're climbing back up. They were at 13, now they're at 15, so... Slowly but surely, surely, they're starting to get their revenge for losing their gun. These other guns, though, they're just... Wow, are they racking up the points. 433 for that one battery over at the, on the right of the high sun. Oh, Prussians, where art thou? I am itching for you guys to show up. I'm just waiting to unleash this beast I have set up over here. And look at all this I have back here. Cavalry. More cavalry. The Imperial Guard. I mean, nothing's going to break through this. And then over here, we got the same thing. More cavalry, more Imperial Guard. That is just a monster defense we have set up. More cavalry over here. And then we have uh, Allard and Schmidt's Brigades over here. We have Jammin's Brigade and Column by Division over here. We have some of uh, we have Watier's Division of Milhout's Corps of Cavalry back here. So... Even this part of the line is still pretty strong. Not that they need to be. Like I said, the Allies are just happy to lie down there and take a long nap. Four hundred and fifty five points for this battery. So we're definitely, these, these numbers are still going up. We're definitely still, you can see we've only taken 13 more casualties, but we've inflicted another 100 casualties on the Allies. So uh, the Grand Battery is still doing its job. Uh, we're just over 28,000 points now. And uh, less than 2,000 points away from what we need for a major victory. And it's only, uh, only uh, 4.20 in the afternoon. And the uh, objective at Place Noir has not even appeared yet. And that one's double the value of La Haison. So, you know, when that appears, we'll be getting 300 points a minute.
And uh, yeah, some of these other objectives are worth a lot. These are worth 200 points a minute, the Allied left and the Allied right. But um, I've never felt the need to go get them because I'd have to fight to get them. <laughs> and I can have enough points to win without fighting at all, really, by just doing this. You see all these infantry battalions that I have back in reserve, too. So, uh... It's really going to be tough for the Prussians. I mean, first of all, a fortress is just really, really, really difficult to crack to begin with. Uh, because it's so adaptable. Um, couple that with the fact that I have... Still have infantry units in reserve that aren't even part of it yet. Uh, and then I have cavalry back behind that. So... If the enemy is able to bring any line infantry to start shooting at my squares, all I have to do is bring up a cavalry squadron right behind the square or right next to the square to force that enemy unit into square. And then uh, then my uh, our squares are fighting on the same terms, but my guns are still pounding away. So um, that's one of the things that makes the fortress so good is how adaptable it is to whatever situation it's facing. So we've got 25, almost 25,000 points just from La Haisant. It's really just coughing up the points left and right. Love it. However, we are taking a lot of casualties. We've taken almost 500 casualties. You can see these guys have taken almost 200 casualties. And these guys have taken 232 casualties themselves. So these units in here are getting hit pretty hard. And pretty soon, we're going to fall below the number of men uh, actually required to hold uh, Lahai San. And at that point, the flag would disappear from the objective, letting us know we no longer hold it. So that's something to keep an eye on. It's not a big deal. I have many, many units set up behind Lahai San for that sole purpose of just replenishing the fort when... Uh, when we fall below that number of men we need to hold the objective. But uh, you still got to keep an eye on it because once you do lose the objective, you're not earning points from it anymore. So you want to fill it up, fill up the fort rather quickly. And in all honesty, I probably should have stuck a unit in there kind of before the Prussians arrive because once the Prussians arrive, I'm going to be busy over here. Uh, uh, watching these fortresses and not really being able to pay attention to La Haisan. I mean, it won't matter because we'll have the Place de objective, uh, but always want to get as many points as you possibly can, right? So 28,500 points. Very close now. We're about 1,500 points short of a major victory which would be about 15 more minutes, but we're only going to be running this video for another uh, five minutes or so. So it'll be at the beginning of the next video we were on, where we will actually cross 30,000 points. All right, so these guys are up to 21 points, up from 13, so they're uh, slowly but surely regaining some points here. The rest of these batteries are crushing. They're absolutely crushing. I gotta give credit to Bylands Brigade. They're, uh... You know, they're receiving the brunt of this, and they're taking it. They're taking it. I think all of his units, except the forward one, are still up there on the sunken road.
So they still got three guns here. They still got their two here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They still got their eight guns here. So uh, haven't taken out any more guns since the last time we looked. None of these units here, I think, are really taking any losses because I think they're um, behind, kind of behind the ridge. So I, I don't see them. I don't see any bodies really. So I don't think they're really taking any losses. I wonder why this general is just standing out here in the middle of the field. Like, don't you want to be behind the lines where it's a little safer? So, almost there. Almost at 29,000 points. And I think we'll probably cross 29,000. Uh, before we uh, cut this video off. Because it's still about three more minutes, but we only need, like, one more minute. So we've taken 550 casualties and inflicted 3,300 casualties on the Allies. So we've uh, damaged a good portion of their artillery, run off a few of their infantry battalions. We have taken virtually nothing. Uh, you know, like I said, tis a flesh wound. Uh, we have lost one gun, which I'm still annoyed about. Playing as cheaply as I am, I don't even like to use, lose one gun. Oh, are we down to two? I see only two here now. Looks like uh, we knocked out another cannon. So, all right, they're down to two guns now. That means that uh, the amount of damage they're going to be able to inflict on the Hassan from now on is going to be significantly less. Because they're at uh, basically one-third of their effectiveness at this point. One more look at our sweet fortress setup right here that's just waiting, waiting for the Prussians to show up and, and, and give them the beating of their lives. Oh, they can taste it. So uh, we're winding down here. We're going to uh, cut this video off at 16.30, so about 10 more seconds. All right, guys, there we are, 16.30. Uh, so that is the last of the truly boring videos. In the next video, the Prussians show up, and we go to war. So... Uh, that's it for now. Uh, like I said, I know this battle is pretty boring so far, but, uh, you know, we're taking the easy, cheap way out to win here. Uh, and uh, as I said, in the next video, the Prussians will show up and uh, then you'll see a real fight. So that's it for now, now guys. Uh, take it easy and I'll see you next time.